Hi, my name is Walt. Hi, Walt. Hi, Walt. Hi, Walt. Walt. And I might be a grammar Karen. Oh, in a previous video, I gave the following advice to a fellow who had just moved to Saipan. Culturally, I would advise anyone moving to this side of the world just to observe how things are done and don't attempt to force a Western, an American, or your own personal wishes on how people behave. Uh, you are the foreigner, you are the uh, newcomer, so it's up to you to be respectful of the dominant culture. During the course of our email interaction, he mentioned that he's he likes to be precise in his communications and he's a stickler for good grammar. So I mentioned to him that if he, if he wants to live a stress-free life on this side of the world, that he may want to suppress his inner grammar Karen because he's likely to run into some things that might might stress him out in countries where English is not the native language. They are going to run into instances where there might be misspellings on forms, there might be misspellings in on menus, there might be misspellings on street signs you know, or you know, traffic signs. There are entire YouTube channels that are devoted to the peculiarities of translating Chinese into English and other languages into English, and some of the mistakes that they make are, are kind of funny. There is a fellow who I read about who made a good living, a nomadpreneur living, going around and offering his translation services and, and his grammar correction services for menus at restaurants and stores around Southeast Asia. This is something I have a little bit of experience with, so I'll share some of the things that I do. But before you judge me, hear why I do it, and perhaps you might judge me less harshly. There was one instance I recall where I went into a doctor's office, or it was a dentist's office on Saipan, and I noticed that the intake form had some grammatical errors on it or misspellings. So I made the changes and then I gave it to the receptionist and suggested that it's something that they may want to adjust. I have uh, uh, corrected the grammar or spellings on on the newspapers here on Saipan, the two English-speaking newspapers. I'm friends with the uh, editors of both papers, so I feel comfortable doing that. My friends will often ask me to edit their resumes or their business letters since they know that I'm, you know, uh, a stickler for accuracy and correctness. So that's what I do. Now, here is why I do it. Let me ask you a question. Let's say you and I are friends and one day we meet and you notice that there's a piece of broccoli sticking out of my teeth or there might be some mucus thing hanging out of my nose or my eyes or something, a leaf may be dangling from my hair. Would you tell me? Now, if you're my friend, I would expect you to tell me the same way that I would tell you or anyone. I'd tell strangers. Sometimes I'll see something that might be potentially embarrassing about a stranger. I'll walk up to them. I'll say, excuse me, ma'am, excuse me, sir. You have a piece of lint on your blouse or something like that. So it's something that I do because I believe I'm helping that person out. I, they wouldn't want to reach the end of the day and realize that they've walked around the entire day and no one told them that they had something potentially embarrassing hanging off their face. So that's why I do it. I do it because I believe I'm helping the, that person make a better presentation. And it's what I would want someone to do for me. And the reason I do it in the, in other instances, for example, the, uh, doctor's office or the dentist's office is for the exact reason. And notice I didn't say exact same reason because that's unnecessarily redundant. I do it at the doctor's office because I believe somewhere in that organization, it may not be the cashier, it may not be the um, um, receptionist, it may not be the floor manager, but somewhere in that organization, there is someone who will appreciate the fact that I'm helping them make a better presentation. Uh, they wouldn't want to end up 10 years late down the line and realize that for the last 10 years, they've been handing out a form that has had a mistake on it. I would want someone to do the same to me. It's, if it's my website, if it's my book, and you come across an error, I would, I would hope that people would point it out so that I can correct it to help others. So that's why I do it. I'm doing it to... Um, because I'm looking out for other people's best interest. So why is it important to me? I know it's not important to everybody. There are people who may read 
um, um, something on a comment, for example, and there'll be an error, a grammatical error or misspelling, and they'll say to themselves or to others, well, I know what he meant, I know what she meant, so I'm not going to correct it. But I believe that it needs to be corrected, and here's why. I'm looking at the bigger picture. I'm looking at the fact that there may be children who are growing up who are seeing their influences on YouTube, who are seeing uh, politicians, who are hearing um, pundits and uh, anchors on the news making these mistakes, and they're, they're believing that because an adult is saying it, that it must be correct. And then they end up um, perpetuating the errors, and then it gets you know, a wider and wider, wider use in society. I'm also thinking about people, let's say, ESL students and English as a second language student, someone who's learning, and they're hearing an English speaker saying these things, so they say to themselves, well, it must be correct. An English speaker is saying it, so this must be the correct way to say it. So if we let it go and if it spreads throughout the world, then we are contributing to the devolution and the decay of the English language, and we're contributing to the idiocracy. So that's why I do it. I'm thinking about the bigger picture. I'm doing it for the benefit of mankind. Oh, well, uh, one thing I almost forgot. And while we're on the topic, one of my major pet peeves these days is the use of, the overuse of, and by that I mean the misuse of the word literally. Now, if you look it up on the internet, you'll even find Merriam-Webster over the last few years has jumped on the bandwagon, and they have condoned and sanctioned the use of the word literally to mean a way of adding emphasis to an idea. But those of us who learned English before the rise of the idiocracy know that it typically, in conversation, in dialogue, in writing, it's rare that you would actually have the occasion to use the word literally, and I'll, I'll explain why. Generally, there is no literally without a figuratively. Literally is used to make a clear distinction between something that was once formally uh, only figurative in its meaning, and it is now um, transposed into the physical world and literal world. I'll give you an example that I, that I tend to use. There's a figure of speech walking on eggshells. Now, if you're not familiar, walking on eggshells simply means that you're being cautious, you're being quiet, you're being delicate, you're being um, careful in a particular situation. So, that, for example, you might have a father who gets drunk and often gets violent. So you might find yourself saying, when we were growing up, uh, our father would often get drunk and he would get violent when he's drunk. So when he came home, we would find ourselves walking on eggshells around him. You can picture it um, uh, visually. That means they're stepping gingerly. They're um, being careful not to break the eggshells, not to make noise, not to crack them. So it's a figure of speech that means you're being cautious. Now, let's say in that same household, one day, the children go into the kitchen and they open the refrigerator and they happen to uh, spill a carton of eggs and the eggs fall to the floor and they crash and now there's a mess all over the floor. And in order to clean it up before their father wakes up, they have to walk across the mess to get to the mop to clean it up. So they could, in that instance, say correctly, in this case, we were literally walking on eggshells in order to get to the broom to clean up the mop to clean up the mess before our father woke up. So that's the typical standard historical use of the word literally. It's generally in reference to something that is a figurative statement. And now, um, through some unusual circumstance, it is now a, uh, a literal statement. People are overusing it every day. There's a popular YouTube uh, ad that says you, you can literally turn back the hands of time. No, you cannot literally turn back the hands of time because time does not have physical hands that one can turn back. A clock does, but time itself does not. People will say something like, uh, uh, he liter literally came and sat next to me. There's no reason to say he literally came and sat next to me because sitting next to someone is a physical action in the real world. So there, you don't need the word literally to, to modify it. 
in nine out of 10 cases, most people can simply leave it out. He came and sat, um, sat next to me. Or they could say, he actually came and sat next to me. There's no use for the word literal. It just doesn't make any sense. There are people who use it to start sentences. There are people who use it as a crutch word. They can't think of anything else in much the same way that people say, um, or, uh, uh, or, you know, as a filler word. I'm guilty of doing that sometimes. But anyway, I digress. My point is, if that's the sort of thing that gets under your skin, then you might want to practice just letting it go and choose your battles wisely and uh, don't be a grammar Karen. But that's just my opinion. But when it comes to my opinion, I am the leading authority worldwide. So I hope that's helpful for someone and I'll see you in the next video.